there is no rules to success. <laughs> so, <laughs> there, there are suggestions. Um, there are similarities to things that work, but like for me, corporate, it took me a while to figure out how I could be successful in a corporate environment. And I realized I kept running into a brick wall of when I was trying to scale up and go into leadership and all those stuff. I kept running into a brick wall because I was trying to talk the talk the way everyone speaks. I was trying to dress and um, do all the behaviors and do everything that people do. And quite frankly, it's draining. Welcome everybody back to another exciting show, the About That Water podcast, where we help you build strong financial habits. And I actually have the honor to bring on uh, a special guest who's been helping people build um, great money moves. And one of the cool things I, I love about his story is that he has come such a long way and understanding, uh, navigating pretty much society and now actually helping out a lot of people. So Jonathan um is nearly have over a decade experience in the financial services space um which led him to top several banking institutions as well as credit unions he was able to do this because he actually understood how people manage their money decrease their debt and save to invest so how are you doing today jonathan no i'm glad to have it i appreciate you inviting me on <laughs> uh, no problem thanks um because you actually have a show called money talks yeah, I actually thought that was actually a pretty cool name because it's like we talk about money. There is no ambiguity <laughs> in that uh, that situation. So, um, you know, I don't want to talk about everybody always asks this question, like where you started money, blah, blah, blah. blah. But, <laughs> you know, you came from a, a realm where you started out at McDonald's. Right. Now, actually teaching people how to do better with their finances. Yeah. Um, how was how was that transition? Um I mean, I don't want you to take forever. What was your mindset from McDonald's, Jonathan, to where you at, Jonathan? I mean, to be quite honest, I still work with the same mindset. So for me, McDonald's was a promotion. So before I went to McDonald's, uh, I was cutting grass, had, my own, had several lawns I serviced, cut the church grass and different uh jobs like that, like putting in retaining walls for people homes. So when I was able to get 16, before my mom took me to get my license, she actually, she was like, well, you're getting a job, you're getting one today. Uh, but for me, it was, okay, this is a consistent check type thing. Uh, so uh, McDonald's really kind of taught me just kind of the basics of everyone, you know what I mean? This is how you work, this is how you show up, uh, you got your manager, you got, you know what I'm saying, all those different things to try to immerse yourself. To um, now it's more, okay, your job is a piece of income. And I don't think people understand how powerful it is. And what you do with your income is really the biggest piece. So the work ethic is still there it's the same it's just how i slice and dice my income now is way different because it was just hey i mean i worked at mcdonald's so i didn't buy a lot of fast food but uh clothes and buying the uh stuff to get me through high school and paying for car repairs and all that uh those things came up frequently so having and respecting your income uh was is very important to me even more so i think now because look at what type of situation we in. even though it might have caught some people off guard but this is fairly predictable if you've had a seven eight good year run and everybody's feeling good you should know around the corner it's going to probably be a contraction in the economy and it's going to squeeze you a little bit tighter if you're not prepared what were those uh, money conversations like to um, obviously we all grow together in the marriage, right? Uh, has those conversations? do you still have like money conversations since you were dating and now married? Yeah. So when we started dating, truth be told, I, she helped me get into banking. So when I, when we started dating, I had a 500 some credit score. Uh, my wife was four or five years into her career. She went, um, she got her MBA, um, uh, went to school debt free, uh, got her MBA. She was working at her corporate job. So she was doing everything that I was trying to do. And then she had a solid credit score and she had savings. So when 
it just kind of randomly came up. Actually, it didn't randomly come up. I need some tires. And she was like, oh, how come, uh, why don't you just uh, get money from your savings? That was normal to her. To me, she was like, so you don't have savings? I was like, well, yeah, I got a savings account, but I didn't have savings. <laughs> I didn't have money in the account. She, so that made her question like, well, okay, do you have like a credit card? I was like, nah, because I didn't, I had a 500 score. I paid off all my collections and all those type of things, but I didn't have anything perpetual that was building me forward. Cause I'm like, I mean, it didn't do me no good. So she was doing all the right habits and what really kind of introduced me to, Hey, these are the first few steps you need to get in. And so that's where the conversation kind of began with us because it was with her that, okay, let me go ahead and take one of these capital one credit card offers took that started building my score then she was like well how how much is your limit well when i when we go on these trips as couples i mean like, look i can't pay for both our tickets right. it, it's gonna take us and she's like just put it on the credit card i was like yeah but my limit don't right. work like that right. so uh right. so it took me a while to get get to that point and through conversations and constant consistency and yet yeah, she helped me get into the bank so I was able to learn at a lot more rapid pace. Um, I ended up getting to 800 and started saving aggressively. And I was doing all these things when we were long distance that she came to be surprised with because she realized when we got engaged, obviously we're sharing our income at that point. And she's like, oh, you only made 40, 40 grand last year and you did all this? You know what I mean? Because she, she couldn't fathom what was going on, but I understand her perspective of, I mean, this is the same guy who had a five underscore, no savings and uh, life was, life was different, but the conversation is difficult. Um, truth be told, cause I mean, she was an independent woman, uh, still an independent woman. So we had to learn how do we, how do I do moves with taking respect to the fact of she's done a lot already for herself. And if you strip a person of their independent, whether an independent woman or independent man, you you have to give respect or you have to engage them in a way that they're feeling respected. So it took a lot of work in the first couple of years to kind of break the barriers of when I'm asking you this is not to embarrass you or to shame you uh, when when I'm doing this. Or I asked, I just asked the question, like to me, I'm a grown person. And then for me, because I'm again, I'm a money guy. So I'm like, oh, we could do X, Y, and Z. I realized, yeah, the type of success that I think I want to have is not going to happen that way because I chose this partner. So you're only going to have a certain level of success and you have to kind of get that deep in your, your head that, oh, okay, yeah, you could do those things, but I'm not with somebody that I'm going to do that. <laughs> and you have to be okay. Like, she wants to be successful, but she don't want to be, like, aggressively saving like that. She, she want to enjoy her life. So if we're enjoying life, that means we're not saving as much as we could have uh, and investing as much as we could have. So those are the things that early on in any marriage, you have to learn how to get that mutual respect down um, understand, hey, this is our plan. This is how we do things. Uh, and over time, at least for me being a man, I've proven out time and time again why when I say, hey, we need to do this, this is the way we do it to where now it's when we were getting ready to buy the house, it was no question. She was doing the decorating. I was handling the finance. And then the maturity of our relationship is really when you we've got we shifted to hey what can i do better to we only try to allow people each other to do the things that they're best at <laughs> so if if you're always living in your strengths you're always going to be bringing a ton more value in the relationship so that goes back to you know she brought the table you brought the chair Right. And now it seems like you're handling the food on top of the table and now she eating well. So Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. Uh and but it's it's one of those things that like and again, I'm I'm on the TikToks, I'm on IG, I'm I'm seeing all this thing. In fact, I just did a video where people were like, it, it seems like people are so aghast or they're looking at, hey, if I lose or if I get with a woman and a woman's asking me to take her to a nice restaurant, 
oh, she's just trying to get over. That's the cost of doing business. The the purses, the you know, saying the extravagant trip, whatever your particular spouse may desire, that's the cost of being in a relationship. For me, it's much it's needed that you get them what they desire, not oh, she wanted a Louis Vuitton, you hand her a coach or a micro court. She didn't ask for a coach or a micro court. She asked for a Louis Vuitton. So go get her that. But the back end value of getting the person what they want is you get exponentially further. And then even for me, like I work a lot, but she makes sure if I want something, I get it. And it's not a wait <laughs> for me getting it because I mean, I don't make her wait to get the stuff she, she would like. Uh, so that helps uh, to strengthen. But that goes back to um, one of the clips that you did on speaking of your YouTube channel. You just started taking off with the shorts. I was like, this guy. <laughs> yeah, I found my rhythm. <laughs> I, I definitely found my rhythm. Because uh, one of the clips that got me thinking, and I wanted to bring this up, was where the guy was saying is that $20,000 for a wedding. Right. And coming home and still living in an apartment and so forth. Mm -hmm. um can you expand on how your wedding was and what was your guys like mindset around that well so again she's always um a step ahead so we were dating she when i moved to charlotte she went ahead and bought the home uh and side note she bought it with the idea that hey one one day this is going to be a rental she looked at the area all that and that's what uh occurred presently but yeah we we spent what 29,000 30,000 we had the wedding in Charleston and anybody who's been down to Charleston that's like the number one and number two wedding place in the world I didn't know that until I got there uh and every, the reason whenever you ask them hey why does this cost so much is oh it's Charleston well that's not good enough for me <laughs> you know what I mean? so, I'm like you just automatically get to charge these prices but I mean the guy's video the only reason why it triggered me was um, there's a lot of shaming in what people are doing. I'm like, people are doing what they see and you're expecting a person who their parents, you know what I mean? They want to impress their parents. They want to make sure their parents have a good time. They're not financially equipped to realize, oh, I just spent $20,000. I could have bought a house. That doesn't need it. Like, seriously, it doesn't even enter a person's mind. In my case, we had already bought the house, so I was a lot, and I was definitely more educated at that point, but I was a lot more comfortable with doing the purchase, only we had to do it in cash, meaning before that wedding, before we said I do, everything was done and paid for, right. and then right after our wedding, truth be told, we didn't have a, a fully funded emergency fund. That was first thing. I went to work those next six months to build that up quickly because I'm like, we're about to be in a problem. You know what I mean? So, uh, but no, that was, that's the biggest thing that I saw. I'm like, well, yeah, if you tell somebody after the fact, yeah, they're spending 20 grand. Oh, you could have bought out. You're right. But you're basically telling them either have a wedding or get a house. <laughs> and what you're really trying to explain to them or what you're really trying to say is, to your point about my idea of planning is when I was 20, when I was 16, like, or even before 16, like the whole idea was, Hey, things are going to happen. There are natural things that's going to happen. So when I was 13 and my mom was like, well, you know, at 16, you're going to want to drive, right? Yeah. I'm going to want to drive. She's like, what are you going to drive? I'm going to need a car. <laughs> so <laughs> 13, I was putting money away so that at 15, I could buy the car. Well, that same level of thinking, when I was in college, I'm like, well, I know eventually, I'm not getting married today, but I know eventually I'm going to want to get married. So I socked away money for what I thought I wanted to spend on a ring. I didn't sock away money for what I thought the wind would be. <laughs> so I, I missed. <laughs> so, uh, and that's why we didn't have an emergency fund. And that's why I tell people, I'm like, yeah, if you, because as soon as I got engaged, she was like, yeah, we need to plan a day. I was like, well, I thought it was a while before you right. came. She's like, nah. <laughs> she was like, it's customary. Like, after you get 
get a uh engagement you got a year to 18 months. i was like well who said that well everybody knows. i was like everybody don't know because i didn't know that <laughs> so i thought it was just you get the ring and then then you got Figure it out right so um and then most people if you're living in an apartment well most people you know you're not going to want to live in an apartment all all your life you're going to want to buy a house so you start saving up for just a starter house and if you're younger and single, single, the better thing or the better move would be buy the house early because yeah, whenever whoever you get with, you're probably gonna move. It's it's not a big deal, but at least you have a whole lot more in that equation because you already have a house. You'll likely have the equity, and you won't have to like scrounge for saving. <laughs> you know what I mean to go try to get this next place. So it's really about for me with that conversation yeah you're spending 20 grand when you can right but truth be told that person may not want millions of dollars or the responsibility of the house my thing is if are you saving at all do you even have a savings so if you don't even have 20 grand in the bank why are you spending 20 grand for a wedding but that same thing could be said about why are you buying a 30 grand car <laughs> and you don't even make but 40 grand that it don't it just doesn't equate and that's the 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 difference in helping people to develop. Hey, I need to learn how to make better choices, and I need to know what those choices are, and figure out. Okay, I can't get this now, but well, maybe it's not a good time for us to get married. Or if we're going to get married right now, maybe we need to do it differently. Maybe we go to a courthouse and then we do a party a little bit later to allow ourselves some time to. Okay. mesh into this scenario so that's what uh me and my wife did we actually got married by the justice of the peace and i was like hey it's 35 dollars, right <laughs> we spend that on drinks anyway so right like, <laughs> so let's go on and knock this out i didn't just say like let's go knock this out but it's right like, we had that already in plan and then the reception anyway was going to be um in another location because right. we just wanted the immediate family the mutual family and then do the reception later because pretty much if you look at it, everybody's just eating on your dime. Right? Yeah, they are. <laughs> and the place are 100, 125. I'm like, that's a nice dinner. You know what I mean? And <laughs> you're looking at this list, you're like, man, do I even like you that much to, right. you know, spend what I mean? $100 on you? Yeah. <laughs> and so, like, people people were looking at us strange, but I'm like, dude, they, they were like, well, what can we get you? I'm like, dude, we registered at the bank. <laughs> you can you can you can send us to the body. You can sell. I don't care what you do. That's where we register. I don't want no pots. I don't want no blender. We we got all that stuff covered. You know what I mean? Just send, send us whatever you was about to uh, buy. And I do understand what people are saying about people who say they're coming to your wedding and you didn't pay for this space and then they don't show up i'm like die <laughs> you know I me mean? you i should send you a bill hey this is how much your plate costs you need to you need to do that so um it, it's it's a lot in that whole wedding thing it is one big party and you do want to celebrate but a lot of people don't understand it's at the debt what is it at the, the detriment of what is it really costing you mm -hmm. Yeah, we can have a whole another topic on that one for the other <laughs> finances. Um, so one of the things is that, you know, let's move on to like the, the second segment, which is talking about um, some of the adversities that you um, have overcome. And like, what are those habits that you that took you to where you are today? So, um, man, that's a, that's a really good question. Number one, um, work ethic helps so um the number one thing i'll always say and people have found is my work ethic is bar none they just never seen somebody work like me but i get energized off work so um that's probably a little bit of a cheat code so if you're willing to put forth a hundred percent effort not necessarily looking for anything in return you'll always typically win because you have the patience to endure but so work ethic is always number one. The second thing is <laughs> there is no rules to success. <laughs> so <laughs> there, there are suggestions. Um, there are similarities to things that work. But like for me, corporate, it took me a while to figure out how I could be successful in a corporate environment. And 
I realized I kept running into a brick wall of when I was trying to scale up and go into leadership and all those types. I kept running into a brick wall because I was trying to talk the talk the way everyone speaks. I was trying to dress and um, do all the behaviors and do everything that people do. And quite frankly, it's draining. And so I realized that I'm like, hey, if somebody, I have a, a couple of step process, number one, if you're trying to get promoted, everybody want, sometimes want to get promoted, but they typically want more money. But whatever job you're trying to get at your job, first year is usually you adjust into the company and you learn the job. But around about the nine month mark, you're probably going to start being like, OK, what's next? Yeah. Cool. By that point, once you get to that year, you should be like, OK, I want this job. You then have to understand if you're qualified and you've kind of built your skills up, you have to understand, is it possible for me to get that job here? And you have to be very vigilant about getting a fast answer to that, because if you don't, you'll waste a lot of time. So my thing is, if I believe I can get this job here, then I'll get the job here. If I believe it's going to be a problem, I'm out. I'm going to I'm going to somebody else. And a lot of people don't understand. I'm like, yeah, me, I'm a shot fire. I'm going to apply. I'm a network on LinkedIn. I'm going to talk to whoever I got to talk to to get me to that next step. And what I found was with my at least my process, like even now, I still get I get rejections from jobs daily. You know, what I mean, from jobs that I probably forgot I applied. I, I actually do forget I applied to, you know, what I mean, because I'm like, I, it's just if they didn't say I want to interview in the first three or four days, yeah. I I got declined. I'm on to the next one, but I'm not looking for that. I'm just paying attention to who wants to interview. But eventually you will see throughout the seasons, if you're continually applying, continue to apply, you will get the opportunity because you'll probably fail at a couple of interviews because you never interviewed for this before. So once you figure out, okay, these are the questions, this is what they're looking for, by that third time, okay, you can close the deal. Yeah. That's, that's the process by which we all need to endure because everyone can't go to a company and just scale up. <laughs> uh, the next thing, so we got work ethic, then second, you need to figure out, you know what I mean, how fast you can, you how fast you can matriculate up the organization and le or leave. Uh, third, you do need to learn how to negotiate um, your salary, which negotiation means have a conversation about total compensation. <laughs> Not, you know what I mean, don't go in a 70K job where that's the high and be asking these people for 90. They'll think you crazy and don't even want to talk to you. And you'll walk out their door looking at 65 and they'll hold firm. Yeah. Like you need to know what is the market range for this job? Not particular at this um, company, because if this company doesn't have a range that fits within that market, best believe they have another way of paying you to compensate for where they're lacking. And that's the conversation you got to have so that you're not necessarily leaving money on the table, but understand you'll, for me, you'll never get all the money that they could have gave you because you don't know all the different levers that that particular company could pull. Yeah. You just know industry standard. So be okay with, okay, they offer me 50. Most of the people probably at their job probably make it 55. If I come in at 60, I still won because I got more. And you would definitely won if you went from 35 to 65, yeah. you know, so, so like, but don't, you know, see, yeah, like people, not, yeah. people can feel like they got rejected. I'm like, nah, you got more than you was going to ask than you would get. So, um, and then after you learn how to negotiate, then it's just, um, if you're an entrepreneur, truth be told, I, I don't suggest people leave a nine to five because <laughs> you put too much downward pressure. And I mean, you're you're on YouTube, you're you're on all these spaces. You know how difficult it is and just statistically to get these channels and get these social media pages up and running. And too often people are saying, well, you're investing in your business. I'm like, well, OK, if you're investing in your business, your business not making money, but you just went and took out ten thousand dollars worth of debt for a business that's not even making money yet. You're not even giving yourself a chance. And then you say, you know what? 
I'm going to, God's telling me to bet on myself. God is telling me to leave my job that pays me <laughs> to go do something that's nothing. You think God would tell you to do that? <laughs> like, no, God doesn't necessarily set you up for, um, for failure like that. He might say, it's time for you to think about <laughs> transitioning out and build a plan, but he's not going to say, yeah, leave your job the way you're making money <laughs> and not have a ram in the bush. So, um, those are things that that's why I tell people like, Hey, this is, this is what it looks like. And what you're trying to get, what's your success, what you're trying to get from a money aspect, what you want your life to be. None of that is going to pan out like you think it is. Cause I'm pretty sure 10 years ago, you were not thinking about doing a podcast and editing and meeting people and setting this stuff up. That's me too. I'm right. like, I never thought I'd be doing these things and it would find fulfillment, which kind of brings everything back to if I could, my last point on it is everything should be really kind of done in seasons. Um, meaning I'm 36, about to be 37 in a couple of weeks, but what makes me happy and the things I'm doing now <laughs> is not what made me happy at even 32, <laughs> you know what I mean? And what I thought I would be doing. And the reason for that is, well, at 37, I've been married five, six years or 64 months. The, uh, I, have a, I have a toddler running around the house now. We got a new house. We got renters. None of that. I, I am 32. I knew I'd be investing money <laughs> because I've kind of figured out the stock market piece, but I didn't think I would have a real rental property and be looking for more. So the point is to think that your life, you're making decisions for 10, 15 years. You're not, you're making decisions based off your se season of life. And when one thing changes in that season, your desires change for how you want to do things. <laughs> yep. And that brings up to the third segment, which is the features. So where do you see yourself in the next two years? Next Two years? Yeah, just two. So I'll probably, I, I definitely don't, I definitely think I'll have more subscribers and more people um, from the, uh, from the social media platform space. I'll have um, more influence, so to speak. Uh, I definitely will have grown in my career, although I'm starting to get to the edge of, of, what I can do with the career. Uh, and then I, I'll probably have at least two years, two or three. Uh, I should probably have three, three rental properties at least um, closing in on probably maybe about six. I'm sorry, two, probably about 2 million net worth at that point. Uh, so which net worth uh, good thing, but how that translates is basically in our life, we would just have more financial independence to, are we going to continue working? Is my wife really going to continue working at the pace she's working? <laughs> Got you. Yeah, that's, um, and the reason why I asked that question, because every person that I asked that question actually wound up reaching their goals on average about six months from the time that they say it on the show. So I will definitely want to check in when you actually read that 2 million uh, mark and uh, definitely love it. like to have you back on the show about that time. Absolutely, brother. Awesome. So you ready for the final four questions? Sure. All right. <laughs> so what does wealth mean to you? Time. <laughs> you own your time. <laughs> All right. Uh, number two, which is what was your worst money mistake? I bought car loans way too early. <laughs> uh, number three, what is your favorite financial or non-financial book? The Millionaire Next Door. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, and then your last question is, what is your favorite dish to make? Uh, chicken wings and spaghetti. <laughs> I know it's like cliche. <laughs> it's like cliche, but yeah, yeah ch chicken wings and spaghetti. <laughs> awesome. uh, so this is the very last question of the show, which is where could people find out more about you and your company? 
No, I appreciate it. So we have a Money Talks Facebook group. Uh, it's about close, closing in on 1,600 members in there. Talk about financial. You got access to me. Uh, there's a paid version of that group as well, but that's VIP. But the Money Talks is free. Um, interviews, all those different things. You can get your questions answered there. Uh, Money Talks with Jonathan on YouTube, J. Thomas Solutions and on TikTok and Instagram. Um, those are all NIG. <laughs> Well, yeah, IG is Instagram, so J Thomas Solutions there. Uh, and yeah, it's just um, a good good time as best I can. And honestly, my content is really built around you, you building wealth, but um, try to partner with the bank to help you and use the tools to help you uh, be successful. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for being on the show. Um, for everybody that are out there, make sure you like, subscribe, and share this content because if you got any value out of it, I'm sure somebody else did. And always be safe and make sure that you are taking a little bit of time to invest in yourself. Take the 30 minutes or so. It's The ROI is impeccable. As you heard from Jonathan, he talked about it, how his one conversation with his then girlfriend to now wife changed his whole lifestyle around finances and all it took was just one conversation so what is that one conversation that you have with your family or somebody that you actually care about that you can actually change their life so i would like to hear about that in the comments make sure you share this content and thank you again everybody y'all be safe